Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to um, this webinar, which is focusing on boosting plastic packaging recyclability, so setting the right standards. Uh, and um, today, um, we'll be welcoming a number of RI projects who are working in this area of plastic packaging recyclability, standardization experts and representatives from the, from the European Commission. So my name is uh, Nicholas Ferguson. I am the coordinator of the HS Booster, so the European Standardization uh, Booster. And we are in a, an EC funded project uh, working in the area of standardization and to improve the way that research projects address and strategically plan and contribute to standardization. So you may have been uh, following a session which just happened at nine o'clock, ran from nine o'clock till, till 9.30 during the EU valorization week, uh, which really focused on the importance of standardization for innovators, for researchers, and for universities and research organizations. So the session looked at the new code of practice on standardization in the European research area. I had very important people, including uh, the chief standardization uh, officer, Mai Verhoot, who really focused on the importance of standards within um, innovation pathways, and in particular for research projects. Uh, she mentioned a number of areas, a number of vertical sectors, um, certainly, uh, the green transition being one of them. And so standardization from, from one quote is, is everywhere and it's essential for ensuring that technologies and innovations that research projects are working on uh, are, is, is central. So not just thinking of standardization towards the end of a research project, but thinking about it right from the initial concept when you're writing your proposal to kicking off your project right at the start planning efficiently and effectively so that you can ensure and, and hopefully have results projects reaching the market uh, better. So standardization is, is an essential part of this, of this route. Now the booster, which is our project, was mentioned a number of times as an important resource to support projects and to support some of, some of the activities and, and actions uh, to help projects get better at how they address standardization effectively and well. We can see the three wishes from, in, from, from the European Commission regarding innovators, researchers, and universities in terms of really raising the awareness on standardization and making sure that standardization is part of all aspects from education to project research and also to funding. So this is important background to today's workshop uh, webinar, and it's an important part of some of the things that we wanna to touch on today. Now, one of the things was education, and I just wanna to touch on uh, our training academy. So the HS Booster Training Academy, which we launched uh, last Friday, which provides standardization training material on a variety of topics from an introductory level to intermediate level, to advanced level, and use cases on how projects have addressed standardization. Everything is available online, and the, this is the, the beta version of the, the training academy, which will be built up uh, with more and more material for, for people who, who, who need a bit of a boost and to understand more about standardization. We have a webinar on the 4th of May, so please do join that. That's focusing on a beginner level of standardization, an introduction to standardization. And we have three more webinars uh, planned in May and June and a further, a further uh, seven uh, by the end of this year. So it's really something to keep, keep an eye on. So a bit of background to our project. We provide consultancy services to EC funded projects uh, through this booster um, program that we, we, that we are managing. We are recruiting standardization experts to basically provide consultancy services to projects so that they can understand better the standardization landscape and plan strategically well uh, on how to contribute to standards. 
an interesting point in the session in the valorization um, in the valorization event was the the fact that in many technologies the existing standards are not sufficient to address uh, issues that new technologies bring up. So it's not only using the right standard, but it's also contributing to new standards. And this is what we hope to support uh, and deliver. So we have examples in today's session. We have a number of really interesting presentations and I'm extremely uh, happy and excited to hear about what they have to say. Uh, in a moment, I'll be introducing Lore Bailagaron uh, for an update on, on, the, on the regulation M58 and also M584. And she's an important person within the uh, strategy around plastic uh, recyclability and the circular economy in general from the commission. We'll then pass on to, to standardization experts who'll give an overview uh, on, uh, on the landscape and how standardization are important for the future. So we'll then hear from three projects that are actually engaged with, with, with the booster. They've applied for support, uh, consultant support, support from, from uh, the standardization uh, expert pool that we are recruiting. And they'll be telling us about how their projects are addressing standardization. There'll be time for a panel discussion with them uh, from, from 11.30. And I'm also joined by, by my co-chair, Sultan Wood from Danish Standards, uh, who will be who will be chairing that second part of the of the webinar today? So everything looks great. We have uh, seventy nine people registered today, which is fantastic. And importantly, we've got twenty one projects uh, represented and a nice distribution uh, across Europe. And you've got many projects here who we really wanted uh, to be attending the the webinar today, who are working in this this area of plastics and recyclability. Just a couple of points on housekeeping. So we are recording today's session so that we can we can publish it on our website and other people can, can see it afterwards. Everything will be available as soon as possible. So hopefully today, including all of the presentations, can ask you please not to activate your microphones unless we give you permission to do so. And if you've got questions, then please pop them in the Q&A box. Uh, and indicate who your question is addressed to, okay? And we'll try to deal with the questions uh, during the, 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 the part after each presentation, or maybe some of the panelists can, can answer the questions uh, on, online. Okay, so there's, um, there's, there's plenty of nice tips there, and I'm sure you know, everybody knows uh, more or less how to work uh, Zoom today after a long experience of using it. So with that, I'll... Uh, finish my presentation and uh, I'll pass the floor um, I'll pass the floor to Lore uh, so over to you Lore you have the floor with your 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 first presentation thank you very much thank you very much so it's working so uh, good morning everybody I hope you can uh, see me well I hope you can hear me well um, I could recognize a number of uh, familiar names uh, in the list of the participants, so uh, uh, good morning and happy to see you again. Uh, if we don't know each other yet, um, uh, so my name is Laura Bayarjou. I work uh, in DigiBro, uh, which is the Directorate General for Internal Market Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs at the Commission. So DigiGro in particular uh, has a responsibility on standardization. So we are the, the, the main DG um, uh, ensuring uh, the relationship between standardizers and the European Commission. And we have the Chief Standardization Officer, Maeve Rutte, uh, that um, Nicolas has uh, mentioned before. And myself, I have been working for 15 years at DigiGro. Um, and uh, in particular also uh, on uh, sustainability uh, topics and uh, product policy and more recently uh, plastics. Um, so uh, basically I, I spoke uh, before this uh, webinar, uh, I spoke with Signe uh, and I understood that uh, one of the, of the so first it's about also having uh, an example uh, of, a, of a standardization case. 
um, that can be linked uh, to innovation. So it's also a practical case. But I also understood that in your group, uh, there may be um, some questions around how do legislation, standards, and innovation work together. So I will start from that. And then I will explain um, the standardization work um, that is being done in SEN um, on uh, plastics packaging recyclability. But of course, I will explain it from the perspective of DG Pro and more broadly of the European Commission. And it will be then, I think, uh, explained further uh, by Vincent, uh, who is also uh, one of the panelists uh, this morning. So, uh, voila, Nicolas, I, I think that, that was it. So let's, uh, let's go. So yeah, so indeed, uh, so starting on legislation standards and innovation, one thing that I wanted to uh, mention before we, we start uh, really um, is that um, the, the philosophy, the, the, the policy principle um, in EU legislation and EU standardization is of course to foster innovation as much as possible and not to uh, reduce the ability of innovators to produce innovation. So there is in particular one uh, well-known principle, I'm sure you know it, innovation principle. Uh, so if you look on, on the website of the commission, there is a much background on this. And more recently in the standardization strategy, Innovation has been named again as one of the five pillars of our innovation strategy, of course, with an angle, which is to say where there is really new innovation, in particular breakthrough technology, uh, we need to ensure that we can anticipate uh, the, 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 standardization, the standardization work that this breakthrough uh, technological innovation or could also be in principle non-technological, will uh, require. Um, and of course, this is because of the standardization strategy where innovation is important that you have got the launch of the standardization booster. So I think it's really important to uh, realize that the, the policy objective for, for the commission is really to support innovation huh? um, in standards and also in legislation. So this, I don't have a, a reference document to explain my third bullet point here on the screen. Um, but so I, I have not checked in which document, you know, but I could certainly find it. But in general, I think there is really a thinking uh, in, in the commission that environmental legislation or environmental requirements, such as the one that we will discuss in a minute on packaging, are meant to steer innovation, not to limit innovation, to give a direction to innovation so that, so that innovation, in this case in particular, will go towards higher environmental uh, ambition. And the other way around, my personal experience uh, in, in 15 years is that when you have innovation on a market, my personal experience is that in general, uh, for environmental legislation or environmental requirements, it leads to a higher level of uh, ambition, to more demanding requirements, and not the other way around. Uh, it's probably not an absolute principle, but I would say in general, innovation and environmental ambition uh, rather reinforce each, each other. So in, in general, of course. Huh? So, so that was just a way to, to, to frame our discussion. Now, if we look at our topic, recyclability of, of plastic packaging and, and innovation, of course, recyclability of plastic packaging is not maybe the kind of deep tech or technological breakthrough that is uh, very much in light um, in the standardization strategy, but it has, of course, implications for innovation. So just to, to frame the discussion, I, I, I try to, to think, uh, okay, what is recyclability? Okay, recyclability, it depends, and maybe you will agree, maybe you won't. It, it depends on the design of the packaging. It depends on the available infrastructure to collect, to sort and recycle. 
And also I put it be between parentheses, um, between brackets, uh, because uh, the, this I will not really touch upon. It also depends on the, the, the quality of the recyclates that you want to get um, for a certain uh, secondary application. So what is the quality of the, of the secondary raw materials that you want to achieve? But if we just look at packaging design and available infrastructure, so the recyclability of my packaging will depend on the design of my packaging and on the available infrastructure. So then I thought, okay, what if I have packaging design innovation? In my opinion or in my personal experience, but maybe you will have um, counter examples uh, to, um, to give uh, to us. My personal experience is that in general, uh, packaging design innovation would um, be aligned with existing rules or existing standards on recyclability. So that once you have some rules and some standards on recyclability, innovation would be steered to remain within that framework. So you may have still much innovation to have a more performing packaging with new features, with new um, characteristics, but still being compatible, in my opinion, with the recyclability framework. Or you may have innovation where the packaging will become easier to recycle or more eco-friendly in some other way. But my personal opinion here, and that's something I would, you know, to frame our debate, probably packaging design innovation that is incompatible with existing rules on recyclability would be very limited on, on the market. Now, of course, if we look now at infrastructure, that's a bit another story. And you will all, all have in mind examples where innovation infrastructure, so new sorting technology, new recycling technology can really be a game changer. Um, sometimes it won't change a lot in terms of recyclability rules and standards. For example, if we think of, a, let's take a PET depolymerization, it doesn't really change the design for recycling guidelines for PET bottles, for example, but it makes the, the quality of the output um, or the, the, it opens up possibilities in terms of quality of the recycled uh, PET. Um, another example, of course, that you will all have in mind, uh, pyrolysis or uh, new sorting technology, which suddenly opens open up new possibilities that would potentially allow much more freedom in packaging design. And that's where actually you may realize, okay, our design for recycling guidelines or standards um, are maybe more restrictive than what could be possible with a new uh, infrastructure innovation. So I put that in yellow because in, in my personal opinion, this is the core of the debate. This is really uh, where the, 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 the debate becomes um, really relevant. So that was just an introduction to, to frame our discussion this morning um, based on what I understood uh, were uh, the questions on, on your mind. So um, now let's maybe take a look uh, to the standardization request that we have published on recycled plastics, in particular to cover a uh, design for recycling of plastics packaging. So just a, a quick reminder why we, why we, we, we have published a request uh, for European standards on design for recycling of plastics packaging. So the origin is uh, the 10 million tons target that was set in the European plastic strategy back in 2018, that the, 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 the target was that there should be pledges um, by stakeholders, private and public, to ensure that the market for recycled plastics in Europe, uh, that was at the time below 4 million tons, would reach 10 million tons by 2025. 
And the interesting thing is that um, the Circular Plastics Alliance, so an industrial alliance that we have launched uh, in, the, in the commission, endorsed uh, this ambitious target huh, because it was more than doubling uh, the market in, uh, in less than seven years. So the Circular Plastics Alliance said, we endorse this target and we will work together to help the EU market to reach this target. So what does that mean in numbers? How do you reach 10 million tons? So this is just a, a, a summary. You can find all the details in the untapped potential report where you have the, the hyperlink on, on the screen. Um, so if you count backward, um, if you want to deliver 10 million tons of recyclates to converters, so you can see here backward that you need to have at least that is a, the proposal by the, the CPA, you need to have at least 18 million tons of recyclable plastic waste available for collection, okay? Every year, of course. So how do you get there? That's also what I found extremely interesting in the work of the CPA. So they published a design for recycling work plan listing a priority plastics products 26 of them, uh, that they said, we commit to help make these priority plastic products placed on the EU market recyclable by uh, uh, elaborating, uh, developing, design for recycling guidelines. What is interesting is that the priority products that you see on the screen, they account for 60% of the plastic waste collected in Europe. So more than 18 million tons, including 50 million tons of plastics packaging waste, huh? which is more or less 80% of plastic packaging waste collected every year in Europe. So we actually thought in the commission that um, this was such um, a good uh, approach that we decided to follow up on this so that uh, not only the CPA would develop design for recycling guidelines for in particular the plastics packaging priority products that you see on screen, but that actually we would like to see European standards uh, that could then be a tool uh, really for the European market. So this is what you, what you see on the screen, what we have requested. So we have requested many more standards in this request, but here I have focused on the one that are relevant for our discussion this morning. Yeah? So designed for recycling of plastics packaging. So you have here also the hyperlink to, to the full document. One thing that is very important to say here, uh, this uh, standardization request that we have issued uh, in August last year, um, as, as a legal basis, the European strategy for plastics. So it is, a request for European standards uh, for a policy objective, but it is not a request under a piece of legislation. So this is not a, so the, the deliverables, the standards that will be delivered will not be directly used for a legislation, which means that the commission will not assess whether the standards are compliant with legal requirements. Okay, um, uh, it will not be um, uh, compulsory to do that. Uh, so, um, of course, the European standards that will be delivered by the standardizers could be used by the European Commission later on also for regulatory purposes. But this is not the, the task of this request, legally speaking. And this is very important to understand. Because what it means is that once we have the standards by, um, so that will be delivered under this mandate 584. Huh? So mandate 584 is the standardization request on recycled plastics. The commission, of course, will want to assess the, the quality of these standards and will be very interested to see how they uh, help uh, to uh, implement our policy objective to increase 
recyclability and recycled content in plastics packaging, which is also the, the objective of the plastic strategy and the Circular Plastics Alliance. And the commission may or may not, that I can't tell you today, may or may not decide to use also these standards uh, for um, regulatory purposes. So in particular, the revised packaging regulation, which would require a, a new a new process, if you want. Huh? So this, um, I'm happy also to answer your questions because I know that it's not always uh, easy um, to understand. So of course, uh, the, so again, my personal experience uh, in 15 years is that when there are very good uh, European standards that are of good quality, that are standards, so it means they have reached consensus in a value chain huh, among standardizers. Uh, they are good, they are existing, and if they are relevant for some regulatory requirements, my personal experience is that in, in general, the commission wants to use them, of course, uh, but it is not something guaranteed. But what we wanted to avoid with the standardization request is that there would be regulatory developments on plastics packaging that would go in one direction, and there would be standards that would be developed going in a completely different direction, because then it would be sure that the commission could not use these great tools, uh, but also it would mean that the standardizers would not you know, work in a direction that would also ultimately be uh, useful for um, regulatory um, purposes. So we have put in this standardization request something that is a bit unusual, which is really a, a request to send to standardizers to ensure a close cooperation between the standardizers and the commission to ensure consistency between the deliverables and the future packaging regulation. So this is really something um, a bit new with this request, and I am really happy to, to answer your questions if you have some. So now, uh, so we have a standardization request based on also on the work that had been done by an, an industrial alliance, an industrial alliance. Uh, there is this work together with the commission on these standards for design for recycling of plastic packaging. And we need to ensure consistency with future regulation. So that's a bit the, the, the framework. So now, of course, what is the commission proposal on packaging saying on recyclability? Of course, it is a commission proposal now in co-decision. So I can only present today the commission proposal. Now, of course, you are all aware the, the final uh, regulation could be a bit different, huh? depending on what the co-legislators uh, will agree. So on this, I will go very quickly because I'm pretty sure that you know already very well uh, these provisions. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight is that in the definition of recyclable packaging um, that we have in the commission proposal for a packaging regulation, design for recycling is really the first point. So the, the packaging to be, to be recyclable will have to be designed for recycling, which is of course very consistent of what we have requested um, in terms of standards. Huh? You have also here a definition of what design for recycling means. Um, so I think the interesting point here, you see design for recycling means ensuring a, you know, a design that ensures recyclability with state-of-the-art collection, sorting, and recycling processes. So here you find again uh, the link between a certain packaging design and a certain infrastructure. I'm happy also to, to come back on the state-of-the-art uh, concept if you are interested. Uh, this is actually very close uh, to the recyclability, def recyclability definition that we have put uh, in the standardization request to guide the work of the standardizers. Uh, so you see uh, recyclable packaging 
um, a packaging which can be salted and recycled in practice and at scale. So the at scale concept, I think this is one of the points that, that will have maybe to, to be discussed huh, between the commission and the standardizers, how to, to address it here. But so it is recyclable, a, a packaging that can be sorted and recycled in practice and at scale with state of the art technology and infrastructure and deliver recycled plastic of suitable quality to be integrated into new products. I would say here really the philosophy of the standardization request and of the commission proposal are, are very, uh, very similar. And then we, we give a bit more um, on design for, for recycling. So now, so I think, you know, these elements of what is designed for recycling are relatively consensual in my, in my personal opinion. Um, now, in the packaging re regulation, uh, how, we, how can you demonstrate that your packaging is designed for recycling? You will have to demonstrate it uh, by looking into a delegated act that will give you design for recycling criteria. Uh, we know that it will consider state-of-the-art collection sorting and recycling processes, uh, nothing surprising. And we know that it will define, it will define performance grades based on the criteria and parameters listed in table two of Annex two. Okay, what does that mean? So we look into table two of Annex two and we find recyclability performance grades, A to E, that correspond to a certain percentage of the packaging unit, uh, which is recyclable. So this is uh, something that applies, of course, to all packaging and all packaging materials. So this is just the minimum common uh, methodology to define uh, recyclability performance grades, okay? And we know that if you are performance grade E, you are not recyclable, which means lower than 70%, but in the future delegated act, there could be also in principle, nothing would prevent to have some other criteria. Huh? So this is just a minimum, but of course in a delegated act at the technical level, you can add uh, other criteria if they are meaningful, if they make sense. And what we know as well is that the extended producer responsibility fees, so the, the fees that uh, producers that place packaging on the market have to pay, will have to be modulated uh, on the basis of the grades, okay? So this is, of course, the commission proposal. This is not yet the adopted regulation, and I insist on this point. So in summary, if we look at the packaging regulation, what does recyclable mean? It means inter alia, because it means also other things, uh, that it has to be designed for recycling. And what does that mean? It means that you comply with a delegated act, which has some design for recycling criteria, and this delegated act can, may refer to a standard, okay? If you have, if you have a, a good standard in place, uh, I guess a, a delegated act uh, can of course refer to a standard. So I hope it starts to be a bit uh, clearer how all this is um, articulated. Um, so I could actually almost stop the presentation here uh, especially if there are already questions uh, in the chat, Nicolas, and I, I count yeah. on you to tell me if there yeah. are. There are, yes. There's, there's one question at the moment, uh, Laura. Thank you very much. That was that was really interesting. And uh, in particular, this point about the the, the, the standardization request and uh, and the, the legal aspect. I think yeah. it's a very important thing to, to, to highlight. I have just a few, two, three more slides. So tell me if we have time for that, but maybe we can take already the questions that we have. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it would be yeah. If, maybe if um if you could if you could answer the questions. So we've got two questions. Uh, first one's from uh, we just got a couple of minutes. So we've got Valeria Grekova, um, and she says that she uh, so Valeria is from ISO, 
and uh, she appreciates the standards efforts in the area of recycling. And she asks what technical committees in Sen Senelec will work on these requests and what is the timeline? Okay, what is the next uh, question? Because the next question is, yep, yeah, the next question is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and they ask, do you think that the upcoming work can foster industry and science cooperation? And then we've got one more, which just popped up uh, from Pierre-Henri uh, Bour Bournazel. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he asks, uh, what is considered a packaging unit? Okay. 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 So very easy. So the technical committee, uh, I think Vincent will also explain very well. So it is a technical mm -hmm. committee on packaging, obviously, uh, 261. Um, and it's a specific working group that was created specifically for this request. Huh? So it's a new working group. And the same has been done in the technical committee for automotive and in the technical committee for electronics and electrical equipment. Huh? So uh, the, these are, this, is, this is a bit new work stream. Uh, and the deadline for everybody is uh, 2nd of August, uh, 2025. Okay. Uh, and of course, I hope that uh, science and uh, industry uh, will cooperate if they don't already uh, so because i'm sure they do cooperate already especially for such matters where sometimes you also need a bit of scientific background in terms of data testing and, and, and so on um so um yes uh, so i uh, i think and pierre henry was asking tell me again nicolas i think i forgot yeah pierre henry was asking what is considered a packaging unit so Yes, that, that's a good question. So this you have also, maybe this I will let Vincent answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a, so a packaging unit, as far as I understand, is really um, the, 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 the packaging that is placed on the market. And that is, but no, but, but I, I think there is more uh, behind Pierre-Henri uh, question. And, okay. and I don't want to, yeah, I, I think, his question either has to do uh, with uh, integral versus separate components, or maybe um, how you, you know, for, so what can you put under a packaging unit, you know? And the, so, and on this, um, I would need to, to double check. So I'm taking the, com the, the question uh, back. Okay. And if it is not answered by Vincent, then I will, um, Pierre-Henri then can uh, contact us, okay? okay the recyclability. When you assess the recyclability, you have to assess uh, the packaging as you find it in the yellow bin or in the in the recycling plant. So, for example, uh, if you you the question is on the lid, on the package, on the pots, for example, you got pots or, the, or tray, you have to consider the lid with the pots or the tray because most of the time, you st you find the lead on on the packaging on the main component uh, in the recycling plant because the consumer don't remove it totally. So we will just develop standards based on the, what happens in the real life in a, in in a waste bin. Exactly, and if you want to define, for example, that a certain lead would be a separate component, you would have to um, be sure that it is indeed removed. Uh, when uh, through the when disposed of, right? Exactly, and uh, I don't know if you use ketchup bottles. Must everybody remove the lid from ketchup bottle? Is not a big issue. So in this specific case, you can have a specific rule to consider separately the two components. But most of the time, is is you find in the waste bin the the tray with the lid or the bottle with the cap, etc. Exactly, and I guess also Vincent, uh, ketchup bottles, uh, all ketchup bottles from different manu manufacturer or different brands, they may be slightly different, but here they would still be a same packaging unit because basically oh, they would still be a same packaging because they are, it's really more or less the same design in terms of recyclability. Or I don't know if uh, that was also a bit the meaning of the question of pierre -Henri. Okay. 
Okay, so I think Pierre Pierre can 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 write in the in the in the Q and A and in the chat if there's any other questions, and you can you can monitor them on the on on the platform, uh, Laurie, as well. So so yeah. and you can actually answer. Okay, he said Pierre says thank you. I think you've answered this question. Thank so that's great. So Laurie, thank you thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, fantastic. Well, it would be online. I know you're, you're, you're keeping time and I think you are very rightly doing so. Maybe first I will just show the last few slides. Yeah, okay. okay. Introduce also, I think, the presentation of Vincent. So I will be very quick. Um, but um, so, what, so when we do a standardization request, and that is something also important, I think, for the project coordinators to know. So there are expectations from the commission that are spelled out or spelled out um, and that are formulated as requirements uh, by the commission. So you have general requirements and you have specific requirements. So if you go to annex two of our standardization request, you can find that. And I have put them on, uh, on the screen. So as we don't have much time, I won't go through all of them because it would take another 10 minutes. But for example, you have interesting things for our discussion this morning rules to identify reference sorting and recycling technology for the assessment. So how do you identify the state of the art sorting or collection sorting and recycling infrastructure against which you also assess your, your recyclability? So I think that is a, a very interesting point. There are also some expectations that are not spelled out in the standardization request, but that have been discussed and that are clearly in the air and that are, I think, clearly uh, uh, expectations from, from our side. For example, how do you ensure that design for recycling guidelines can be regularly updated huh, based on, on that? And also, how do you take into account the innovation principle? So these, I think, also are important uh, elements. So you, you will have the slides anyway. And then I put for you uh, just three background slides on the Circular Plastics Alliance documents that have been given to Sen, so to Vincent basically, as inputs for the work by the standardizers, so by Technical Committee 261. Uh, so I won't go through them now, but I think this is an interesting reading uh, for you. So you see there, there are two umbrella documents on the assessment of recyclability on how do you develop design for recycling guidelines, you know, uh, if you want to do some new ones. And you see, again, regular update is really part of, of the story. And then there are also some elements per uh, plastics packaging category. So this you will get in the slide. This is more background. And with this, uh, Nicolas, I'm happy to. Uh, to thank you. Back to you. Yes. Yeah. Thank. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Laura, that was fantastic. Really, really good, great overview and very important background and information on the the intricacies of the the activities uh, going on. And it's nice to link up now uh, to the technical committee, which is addressing this this mandate. So, I'm happy to introduce Vincent Collard and uh, yeah. Valentin Cotan. Uh, who I uh, represent this technical committee. Um, so over to you, gentlemen. Um, and uh, uh, and you can take the floor now. We see your slides. Okay, wonderful. Hi, everybody. Um, it's just impossible for me to uh, put my camera, but um, uh, I will introduce myself without it. Uh, so I'm Valentin Cotin. I'm an international project manager at AFNOR, which is the, the French standardization body. I'm also the committee manager of the European Technical Committee on Packaging, the CENTIC 261. Um, so my role is to support the development of French, European and international standards in several areas, including packaging. And I used to, to help um, large group to better think about CSR strategy within a French think tank uh, just before 
um, my job uh, at AFNO. Um, Vincent, maybe I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself too before we, we present um, our slides. Yes, very quickly. So I work for CTO, the Green Dot company in France, and I'm in charge of uh, uh, packaging R&D with my team, uh, with all the uh, brand owners, retailers, and packaging converters. And I'm elected last summer by uh, by Sen um, to lead the working group 10 uh, of TC261 on plastic packaging recyclability methodology and criteria. So, so I manage the group uh, for months, uh, and we we just explain what we are doing in the group in the slides. Okay, perfect. So um, I don't know if everyone is acculturated to standardization uh, and how it works. Um, if in doubt, I will try to go back to the basics of standardization before presenting our work at SEN level. So, um, what is standardization and what is the purpose of a standard? Um, standardization refers to designing protocol and policies for creating products or conducting certain activities based on the stakeholders consensus which is a very important word in simple terms in a business environment the process creates a framework and set of guidelines for entities to follow and deliver products and service with a consistent standard and quality um, I invite you to take a look at the different type of standard on the screen. As you can see, it's very large, it's very exhaustive. The standard you can uh, elaborate, you can develop. Um, it permits innovation. Uh, you could um, elaborate and develop a standard for your management, for transparency for your consumers, for example. Um, and to improve the exchange you have uh, with your suppliers or with other um, countries, companies. Regarding the next slide, it's more um, concerning the, the, the way uh, you have to follow um, SEN and ISO standardization works. Um, you, as packaging professionals, for example, need to be part of a national standardization committee to integrate the work um, that Vincent will present just after. Uh, for example, you have one standardization body by country. In France, it's AFNOR. Um, the, in Spain, it's the UNE. In, in United Kingdom, it's BSI. And to integrate the European and international works, you have to be part of this uh, national standardization body. After the possibility uh, you have, uh, it's very large. Uh, for example, if you are interested by the um, packaging topics, you have to integrate the national delegation on packaging and after BSI, AFNOR, UNE or um, another national standardization body will, um, will um, um, invite you to enter in the uh, SEN, the European Organization Standard Committee and ISO, which is the, the equivalent on international level uh, for um, joining these uh, working groups. And maybe uh, it's just a reminder for somebody of you, but standardization committees are composed of uh, very large um, stakeholders, which you, you, you can have some companies, public authorities, laboratories, research centers, consumer, NGOs, trade union, and local authorities. Uh, it's the benefit of standardization. Uh, it's very exhaustive and it's very representative uh, of, the, of the topic of the, the, the of the topic, yeah. 
Um, regarding the works, the active works uh, currently in Europe and international, I uh, selected some um, packaging working groups uh, in the two levels, so SEN and ISO. You have, for example, a working group on management standard for packaging of foodstuff, uh, another one regarding reuse. Um, the last one at Seine level is the, the working group we led with Vincent Collard, uh, which is designed for recycling for plastic packaging products at the ISO level. So um, at the international level, you have working group regarding uh, supply chain application of logistic technology, another working group, a very interesting working group regarding active and intelligent packaging, um, the, the, the packaging of tomorrow. Um, and you have another one, for example, to define uh, the terminology and vocabulary um, in packaging um, topic. Uh, let's focus on the CNTC 261 uh, introduced uh, by Laure Bayargent a couple of minutes uh, before. Um, 34 participating, participating countries uh, currently, a lot of partner org organizations as PRE. Uh, FEV, AUCP, CFLEX, ECOS, uh, a very dynamic. Um, technical committee. Here uh, on the screen, you have some uh, current standard we are developing. For example, here you have an harmonized standard. Um, here, a standard regarding determination of the degree of disintegration under simulated home composting condition. Um, here, a standard regarding flexible aluminum tubes. It's very large. Uh, if we uh, are talking about packaging, we can think about uh, PET packaging, but we can think about wood pallets, for example. Uh, flexible aluminum tube. It's very large and very representative of the, the, the this packaging world. Uh, Last slide for my part, uh, from standardization to regulation, it's the most uh, interesting thing uh, we have. How the CNTC 261SC4WG10 uh, is responding to the standardization request uh, introduced by Laure Bayargent just before. Um, three items regarding uh, the process and criteria to evaluate the recyclability of of plastic packaging, the definition and principle, and the de deliverable uh, on design recycling guidelines regarding uh, several kind of uh, packaging. Um, I let uh, Vincent Collard um, say more regarding this, uh, the, the, this work of WG10. Thank you. Thank you, Valentin. Just <coughs> think about that at the, at the moment. A company which wants to develop a recyclable packaging at European level have to face uh, 30 to 40 different standards that you have, or not standards, but criteria, private guidelines, etc. at European level. Very different guidelines. So they don't know how to do that. And in a normalized market, we try to have um, a single market as possible is very difficult because you don't have the same guidelines to, to develop a packaging in, in, in Germany, in France or Spain. So it's very difficult and we know so sometimes is is relevant to have different criteria or, or definition because we don't have the same collection of packaging waste. We don't have the same recycler, but we don't have the same packaging because we don't eat the same thing, just as an example. Um, we love yogurt in France, so we have a lot of PS. You don't have a lot of PS in north of Europe, for example. Uh, and we know that it's not possible to keep on working with 40 different guidelines to develop the packaging. And at the same time, on the next slide, we observe that each national authority develop um, recyclability definition at national level. Um, just three examples, but we have a lot of examples at the moment. 
And so that's why it's very important to work on phase harmonization um, on the next slide, truth the PPWR regulation and with the standard. And as explained by law, the, the, the new uh, the draft PPWR um, packaging and packaging waste regulation ask for, for recyclable packaging on the market by 2030 and bad packaging, which is not recyclable in the near future and choose delegated act to define you know, with precision what is recyclable packaging and what is not. So different option, uh, you could have in the delegated act, the exact percentage of EVOH you can add into a PP packaging with very difficult rules, very evolving uh, rules in time uh, due to innovation, or you can base it on the standard. It's, it's a possibility in the PPWR. And that's why we, we take the opportunity of the CPA work to develop standards on um, to increase uh, the amount of recycled plastic into products to, um, to propose something uh, to the commission with the industry, with NGO, all together uh, at standard, uh, at same level and propose standards which help to design recyclable plastic packaging to increase the amount of, um, of recycled content, that's the goal of CPA, and to fit with the Article 6 of PPWR, which uh, define recyclability and, and, um, and forced all companies to develop recyclable packaging on the on European market. So that's why we launched standards. And on the on the next slide, and it's quite so, so the ambition is to fit with PPWR to be usable by the PPWR and the delegated act in the future. And the main challenge is to move from the, the voluntary standard uh, guidelines we developed since to more than 20 years in some cases uh, in Europe. Okay, we, we can we from voluntary. Um, from companies, we push to change the glue, change the, the barrier, etc., to rules uh, which uh, conduct to packaging ban from the market. We decided all together to, to, to develop 15 standards in the new group, in the working group 10. So the, the, we focused on three resins, uh, four resins at the moment, sorry, PET, PE, PP, and PS, including EPS and XPS. And we have to develop standards on the full methodology. The question we have on uh, a few minutes ago on uh, how to, what is a packaging unit? But what is plastic? Uh, what's... Uh, uh, how do you uh, you find an, an harmonization when a country use chemical recycling and another one use mechanical recycling? You don't have exactly the same design for such uh, two very different processes. So we have to define methodology. We have to to two standards on the methodology, and we have. Um, 13 standards on criteria and protocols to update the criteria, how to test it, how to test the packaging and innovation to uh, enhance the criteria and to be sure that you are all, always have the good, um, the good criteria in place. So we focus on the PET, P, PP, and PS because today in Europe is the main material which are recycled uh, in, in all countries. Um, but keep in mind that the philosophy of the group, no, it's created. So we test the process. And uh, if I don't know, we develop in the future the recycling of PLA, of PHA, of uh, uh, PEF or whatever. And, um, we, have, we will have a process and a group to do that, to address such innovation but it's always linked with the reality. So we need um, to, to have a sorting of uh, the innovative packaging in you know, at most one country, and we need to have a recycler in place. It's not theoretical development. We don't develop a certification 
this is not about certification, this is about how to test it. Maybe certification on recyclability will be developed by the market after that. And we need, we organize the work with subgroup because it's a huge work. Uh, we need consensus and it's quite difficult because we have different uh, culture, different uh, position at your open level on that. So we have different subgroup, one per resin and one on methodology and one for the sorting protocol. And you know, you have some name on the on the screen. That's the project leader. So Petcor for PET bottles, Sulaire a recycler for PET pots and trays, Cflex for flexible, etc. And we we are in charge as subgroup project leader to develop the standard in time. So criteria and, and protocols. And in time means in the next slide, 2025. Um, or just example, just example before the planning uh, methodology. That's exactly the answer to the unit question. To, so, so when you look at the yogurt on the market, it looks like four yogurts plus cardboard tray. So, but you never find such um, such packaging directly in the yellow bin. So, so you have to assess the yogurt pot, a single pot with the lid, because we find uh, one third of the lid still with the pot at the end of life. And that's exactly the, the, the typical question we will have to address in the methodological group. And to just to explain the criteria, you will find some criteria at the moment on the next slide on the website of uh, EPPP, Recyclai, Saclos, Cotrep, whatever. So most of the criteria are classified in three columns, one green, one yellow, and one red on the next slide. And we have to fulfill all the tables for each resin. Uh, and keep in mind that all the packaging component, barrier, whatever you put in the red list, uh, maybe will be banned from the market by 2030. So that's very important, but it's a very interesting way to develop such um, common uh, um, common rules, common approach, because yeah, <clears throat> because we we are we are building the, the market uh, for recyclability all together by true standardization. We try to do that. So you have companies, you have uh, European Commission, you have NGO, you have some national authorities involved in the standardization, and um, we don't ask to a consultant or whatever to, to define the red list, the ban list. We try to find a consensus altogether uh, and to accept that some packaging composition is not, a, is not an option for the future if we want a circular economy. And yes, the, the planning is we have to deliver the standard in 2025, the 15, uh, on recyclability. And yeah. you, you, we have some uh, planning. Very, very. The first, uh, the first draft document will be published in, in June for consultation. Not a wide publication at this moment, just for people involved in standardization bodies at national level, Afnar, Uni, uh, BSI, um, and uh, and after that we have one, two, three consultation internal. And we conclude with a public consultation uh, next year. Thank you, and so, I thank you, thank you very much, uh, Vincent and uh, Valentin. That was uh, that was excellent. Really interesting to see all the intricacies involved here uh, in terms of how uh, the, you know, the the standardisation request from the Commission can be addressed and what needs to be done um you know by the by the technical committee so a lot of work to be done and uh and of course uh you know as as we mentioned at the beginning a source for for exploring new technologies and emerging uh innovation is of course the, the research projects which are funded by the european commission so i'm going to hand over to my colleague uh sultan um, if you have any questions for, for Vincent and Valentin, please add them in the Q and A, and they can they can actually answer them directly uh, in in the chat there. 
So thank you, thank you again. So I'm going to hand over to, to Sultan now, who's going to introduce three research projects who are specifically working in this area. And as we said at the top of the, the, the webinar, they've, they've actually applied to the booster for support um, in terms of uh, gu guidance and advice from, from standardization experts on how they approach and address standardization. So uh, Sultan, over to you. Thank you for leaving the floor to me, Nick. Um, as Nick just presented, my name is Sultan Wood. I work with the HS Booster Consortium, and I also work at the, the National Standards Body of Denmark, Danish Standards. And uh, next up, I would like to present the three projects that will do uh, each of their, their presentation. First, we will uh, listen to uh, Genar Arguso, Arguse uh, Rivera from uh, UPPET project. And correct me if I've uh, just uh, said that wrong. And uh, after Genar, we'll uh, meet Cesar Aliaga from uh, Merlin project. And lastly, Maria Vera Duran from uh, Simpa. But I'll uh, hand over the microphone to you, Renat. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> Hello everybody, I am Inara Araguzo and I work as a project manager in UNE, the Spanish standardization body. And today I am representing the APEC project, which is a research and innovation project under the umbrella of the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. And APEC is a very good example of uh, plastic packaging recyclability in the sense that it develops new solutions and approaches in, in the field of uh, plastic packaging. Here you can see a list of contents I will follow during my presentation. And first, an overview of APET projects. As said before, APET is a good example of plastic packaging recyclability. In particular, this project, this project aims at cycling polyethylene and polyethylene terephthalate waste uh, to generate uh, biodegradable bioplastics. The objective of that bioplastics is to be used in the production of new food and drink biopackaging. Here's some general information of the project. This is the European Horizon 2020 project. Um, it's a four year project. We started in November, 2020, and we are currently in month 30. The consortium is coordinated by CETEC, located in Murcia, Spain, and is made up of 20 partners from 10 different countries and in particular in UNE we are the partner of reference in everything that is related to standardization activities. Some information about us, UNE. UNE is the Spanish Association for Standardization. We are a non-profit, private and independent organization created in 1986 six, and formerly known as AINOR. We are located in Madrid and the staff is um, about 70 persons. And our main activity is to develop national, European and international standardization. But uh, we are very committed uh, we are also very committed to the integration of standardization in research and innovation. 
And in fact, we have participated in more than 100 projects. Our main role in APEC project is to provide consortium, um, provide support to the consortium um, in everything that is related to standardization. It's important to highlight that we do not participate as national organization, but as a member of European and international standards organizations as ISO and SEM. And the main objectives of standardization activities uh, within the project are to facilitate the exploitation and dissemination of project results by using standards and generating new ones and to increase the long-term impact of the project outside the consortium. Now we go to the standardization activities in the context of European Horizon projects and in particular in APET. This slide uh, reflects in a schematic form the activities that are common to all the research and innovation projects in which we participate. As you can see, we can highlight um, track three macro activities. The first activity consists of carrying out an initial analysis of the standardization landscape. And the objective here is to identify which standards uh, both published and also under development standards are relevant for the project and to identify the technical committees and other standardization bodies that are uh, of interest for the project. The first activity, uh, this, the, this first activity is, um, is very important because it will serve as reference for the next activities and to initiate the follow-up of standardization issues, being aware of the developments. And with that information uh, of that first activity, we can start with the second activity that is the contribution to the ongoing and the future standardization. We have to define a strategy, including the selection of technical committees to contact with and to follow up. And in certain cases, it is also interesting that one or more partners participate in that standardization body as experts. And the objective of this activity is to contribute to standardization through a standardization process. And here we have different ways to proceed. One of them, uh, and we consider it is the most appropriate in, in a lot of cases, is the development of a, of a CUA, it is a Sen Senelec workshop agreement. And other possibilities include the contribution to participate in the development of new standards or to request a modification. And finally, there is a third macro activity that has a cross-cutting character and it consists of um, being the, the main contact for everything related to standardization issues. Here are some results in APET so far. Um, first, uh, eight technical committees have been contacted, all of them linked to plastics, packaging, environmental aspects. Um, we also have some of our partners participating in a total of five working groups that you can see in the list. And um, it is planned that in the next month, we develop uh, a CUA, a SEN publication, as a workshop agreement. And finally, we're going to, some, to show some 
um, outcomes of projects in which UNE has participated that are some successful stories. As said in first slides, uh, UNE has participated in more than 100 research and innovation projects, a lot of them especially related to sustainability. Here you can see some of them. And of course, there are successful stories in, this part in that participation. Uh, we have uh, contributed to standardization in, in, in all of them. Uh, we could highlight four projects, last a few of the so many contributions. Uh, for example, EcoBulk, Inner Water, Next Tower, and D2 EPC. They are all they all are good examples of relevant contribution in, in different ways, such as the publication of uh, same workshop agreements, the creation of technical bodies, or the participation in the creation and the production of new standards or the revision of standards that of existing standards. Um, And that could be every all. So if you have any questions. <clears throat> Hello. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, we're not going to take the questions now. We will wait for that for later. So now we are going to move on to uh, Cesar Aliaga from uh, the Merlin Project. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, can you also uh, see my screen? I will do it bigger. Uh, we can, can you see, see your slides and on the side as well. So you need to go to presentation mode. There you go. Thank you. Okay, now, now can you see my, my slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. First of all, I want to thank for the for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to present our Merlin project in this in this event. So the objective of this project is to increase the quality and and, and recycling rate of multilayer packaging. Okay. So this project is uh, is um, the the title is increasing the quality and rate of multilayer packaging recycled waste. And uh, is uh, it was presented in a European code, and is uh, the, the execution is thirty six months. Okay, we have a budget around five million euros, and we are participating five uh, sorry uh, fourteen partners from seven countries. Okay, so here you can see the map with all the partners. As you can see, all of us are located in Western Europe. So uh, between our our partners. There are uh, SMEs, we have six SMEs, but also we have four uh, research uh, companies, one non-profit and also three large companies. So the objective is to solve the problem regarding, regarding multi-layer plastics. So I have to say that in the Europe, uh, the problem identified was that uh, almost 18 million tons of plastics is generated by, by year and only 42% is recycled. So that means that it has a high environmental and, and economic impact. And one of the most important fraction that are not recycled are multi-layer packaging, okay? Because multi-layer packaging are, are based on several layers. So it's impossible really to, to recycle them, all them together, no? So that's why multi-layer packaging is not well recycled in Europe. So, and inside, Multilayer packaging, we have three main fractions, which are rigid multilayer, basically is uh, PET and PE, for instance, the trays, also flexible packaging, and finally, metallized flexible packaging. Okay, that, that's why we focus our project on this. So I have to say that 17% uh, of the packaging uh, is multilayer packaging, so it's a lot of materials. And also, multi-layer packaging is increasing year by year because 
uh, it gives uh, very nice properties to the products, for instance, to extend the shelf life of the products. But uh, uh, it has several problems for the recycling of these materials because, first of all, because the identification is very complex and inaccurate. So plants can only see the external uh, layer. So they cannot really know if the material is multilayer or not. So it has a so identification is very difficult. Also, the different nature of the layers makes impossible the recycle, no? Because we cannot process, for instance, PET and PE to, together. No, we need to separate both in order to recycle. So the different nature of the layers makes it also very difficult. So sorting is a problem, uh, processing is a problem, and we know we knew before the project that some delamination uh, processes were working quite well. So the objective was really to uh, do research on this. So do research on how can we really delaminate multilayer and how can we really recycle multilayer materials. So that's why Merlin is focused on this, no? in, the develop, in the development of new technologies for the sorting, the delamination, and also the recycle, the recycling of multilayer packaging, including also rigid and flexible, and also metallized, metallized packaging. Here you can see a diagram of all the, the project. As you can see, we have in the center of the, of the image, we are working in those three materials, rigid, flexible, not metallized, and flexible metallized. Uh, but the idea is, first of all, to identify those materials, then to sort those materials, and apply different technologies to each one of them separately. Okay, so uh, mainly we are working uh, with chemical recycling. And then we are getting value from the materials after the lamination. We are getting the value, we are getting the, the, the materials, and then we are manufacturing again uh, packaging materials. So that's why we are working also uh, taking into account other 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 information, not, not only the technical, which is very important, of course, that is, if technical is possible to recycle, but also life cycle analysis to know if it's more convenient or not, because of course processes should be technically feasible, but also environmentally and economically feasible. So life cycle analysis are, are being carried out, also human safety, because to recycle material needs to carry out those kind of, of testing, and also food contact, circular by design also recycling cycle, and we also want to uh, carry out some knowledge to generation that can be the basis for few further developments in the future on this area of research. Also, I have to say that this project is very aligned with the plastic strategy. Uh, so the, uh, the plastic strategy, the plastic le legislation that is now being uh, published in Europe is really aligned with Merlin. In fact, as you may know, now the European Union is working in the in the publication of the packaging regulation. We have now a draft of this packaging regulation that will be published in the following uh, months. So the, this project is totally aligned with the requirements of this uh, regulation because it's aligned with the uh, with the proper management and the better recycling of the materials. We also with the with a view to include the recycling materials in new packaging products. So. We work with smart waste management, the lamination, also sorting, uh, and also with the improvement of the properties of the packaging. So totally aligned, as I mentioned before, totally aligned with this new uh, packaging regulation that is expected. Uh, I'm sure that many of you maybe has have already read this this draft of the regulation. So what are we looking for? So we are in many events in, in Merlin. So what we want to do uh, or what we want to, to have from you all and also for, for all the, the market is to have input, to be able to, to know really that Merlin is aligned with the expectations that the market has. Of course, for research, it's very important to be totally aligned with the market. Uh, also, we want to know that Merlin, uh, we want some input on this. No, if, uh, if Merlin, do you think if Merlin is totally in accordance with the European legislation or is something should be taken into account? Okay, this is also another question that I would like to, to address to all the audience today. Also, uh, we want to uh, give input to the policymakers because we know that also many topics on this are still not covered by legislation. So we pretend that Merlin also gives information to policymakers. 
and the other way around. We also hope that policymakers can maybe ask for, for several developments or, or technologies that we can also cover in Merlin. So I think this, this, uh, um, this dialogue between uh, policymakers and researchers and companies is very uh, important. Also, uh, we want to extrapolate that our results to other value chains because we are working, as I mentioned before, in multi-layer, also in, um, in flexible, rigid uh, multi-layers and also metallized. But we are sure that this technology can be used maybe for other fractions. So we are also open to discuss on this, no? if you think that this technology can be used for other materials. And finally, just to say that we, are, we have an advisory board, which is a, a membership of uh, participants are not partners, are like external participants. So we are inviting the advisory board to our meetings every six months just to share with you uh, or with the advisory board their results and also to have some input from them. So if you are interested to participate in this in this uh, in this advisory board membership please contact me and it would be nice because uh, we can share technical information but we can also uh, include you in in the board with all our partners and i'm sure that it will be also very convenient to to do some agreements and to make a, a nice group for the discussions and for maybe market market uh, propose or, or market let's say uh, possibilities between companies and advisory board members. So if you are able to, to participate or yeah, you are interested, please contact me and I will give you more information on this, on how to, to participate. So you have uh, a lot of information in our web page. Uh, also, you have one mail for, for that. You can also contact me uh, directly. I, I'm uh, as coordinator of the project and we are also very uh, present in LinkedIn and also in Twitter. Okay, so are, you are really, we are really wondering to have you on board and to be able to discuss uh, in the in this last part of the project. I have to say that we are now in the month 23, so we have still 13 months of project, but we are, let's say, coming to the to the last part of the project, which is the validation. So we have the technologies already developed, and we are now really working with validation with uh, with uh, with the partners in our pilot plans. So we are we are open to to give you uh, answers and, and information on those processes and those validations stages. Yeah. So, so that's all. thank you very much. W one last comment. Yeah. No. I, I just want to say uh, yeah. Thank you for for the invitation. If you have any question at the end, I will be glad to to answer. And here you have also my my contact details for your possible questions or or comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cesar, for that uh, great presentation and the insightful presentation. Let's move on to uh, Maria. The floor is yours. Hello. Can you see? I guess you can see my screen. Yes. Perfect. So thank you so much for the introduction and thank you so much for the opportunity to present SIMPA today. Simba is also a youth-funded project, Horizon 2020 project, uh, also dealing with the challenge of making multi-layer plastics more circular. Uh, my name is Maria Vera. I work at URIC, which is the European Recycling Industry Confederation. We are based in Brussels, and we represent the recycling industry at European level. So Simpa, Simpa aims to turn multi-layer films waste into valuable and circular resources to contribute to the European Green Deal agenda. And to do so, SIMPA brings together 13 partners covering the whole value chain of, um, we can see here, research and technology organizations, uh, technology providers, uh, waste management companies, film producers, and URIC is the um, is the uh, is the a uh, partner in the project contributing with the legislative and the uh, standardization work? But the project is coordinated by IPC by Celine Chevalier. That I think she is uh, today with us in in this part in this event. So she she can take the difficult and technical questions. And uh, as I said, Eurek deals with the communication and standardization and legislative work. Uh, the project started in in June to, uh, in 2021, and it will end in, in in next year. And it has a budget of almost five million euros. 
Um, I would like to start also giving a, a quick overview. We have discussed this in the in the this since the beginning of this event, but it's, it's very relevant because this is the reason why SIMPA is six, that why SIMPA was funded, because the commission uh, set very ambitious targets to make uh, plastics and packaging more circular. And the first one is to increase the packaging recycling rate in, in, in Europe. And uh, the first target is by 2050, um, and the target is 50%. And there's uh, still room to, to for improvement to achieve this target because right now the recycling rate for plastic packaging is only 38%. Then we have some other uh, targets that we have mentioned today that all packaging uh, is recyclable on the EU market by 2030. This was a promise of the Commission in the Circular Economy Action Plan. And now with the new packaging and packaging waste regulation, it will be a requirement. Um, we also have the CPA also law explain uh, the, the, this alliance, what is the objective to, to reach at least 10 million tons of recycled plastic by 2050, 2025, sorry. And, and then the new regulation on packaging and packaging waste will introduce minimum recycling content for uh, plastic packaging by 2030. So this is a very ambitious uh, target that SIMPA aims to contribute to, to achieve them. And if we go now uh, 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 on the food packaging sector, on the plastic sector, we can see that there are different uh, food packaging uh, solutions. About 20% of this packaging is not recyclable. This is complex. We call this complex packaging, but mainly multi-layer and multi-material material packaging. Um, we can we can uh, wonder why we use complex packaging if they are not recyclable, but the the reality is that they are everywhere. We use it for, for the protection of food as food packaging. You can see a lot of uh, applications for cooked food, snack, candies, crisps, pet food, uh, coffee, and also in agriculture because they protect, they have an excellent barrier properties. So they protect food and also crops in, in agriculture. That's why they are everywhere. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the development of new uh, films have been uh, focused on how to improve the barrier pro properties, the material properties, rather than the recyclability. And that's why right now, all of them, uh, all of multi-layer M's are uh, being incinerated or worse in, in landfills. That's why SIMPA stems from, from this gap to make a recyclable ballot chain for multi-layer films coming from food and, and agriculture uh, sector. And we have to cover, we plan to cover the whole value chain. So the first step uh, is um, developing innovative solutions to sort the complex multi-layers using near infrared, but also digital watermarking. And this uh, sorting solution will allow us to separate the multi-layers into families that go to, to the two different processes. But multi-layers are contaminated uh, during their, their use, and it's uh, very important to have a step for decontamination to remove the toxic and hazardous substance. And then they will go to recycling, uh, to mechanical recycling, to make new high gas barrier films, but also to physical recycling dissolution. Uh, physical recycling is based on the dissolution and precipitation of the polyphen content, so uh, we can recover the polyphen. These are the two recycling technologies that SIMPA is addressing, but SIMPA will try to uh, address uh, most of the things uh, through the mechanical recycling due to the lowest environmental impact. Then there's a, a final step that is the novel pilot recycling line within line additive metal rheology control and additivation, additivation, sorry, that this step will allow us to reintroduce the uh, multi-layer films into uh, the recycling multi-layer films into new products. This is, this is an essential uh, step to close the loop. Um, there are also two main uh, activities in SIMPA that are related to also to, to this uh, webinar. 
and is the review of legislation and standardization. This is necessary to propose updates and, and, and new standards or new uh, rules to increase the recyclability of multi-layer fins, but also to propose new designs uh, of multi-layer uh, fins to uh, have a new generation of multi-layer fins 100% recyclable. And I want to I want to show briefly some of the results. We as a first step we have the waste characterization, but I wanted to share also the advance in the sorting solutions because even this this week we have a um, a joint uh, prototype trial in in France because this is a, a model that Filigrade and Pelain, two sorting technology providers, are developing. So you can see how the packaging incorporates is almost invisible digital water mass and with this technology uh, we are able to uh, classify the multi-layer fields in two different fa families so they can go to mechanical recycling and also physical recycling. Of course there's also some advances on the contamination and grading and uh, the, the, the technology uh, or for mechanical recycling. All of the results of the project, so all the public results are available in our website. And in terms of pre-normative studies, uh, on, in terms of uh, legislative and pre-normative actions, uh, we in SIMPA we develop a, a, a report covering all the, the legislative context in Europe and also what are the rules at national level in certain specific SIMPA partner countries. Uh, and we also have an overview of the standardization landscape and this report is available also in the website. We are also working with the Horizon uh, Booster so we can be more involved in standardization Apart, we also, uh, apart from this, also um, some SIMPA partners are become are becoming more active in in sense and like uh, committees, and of course dissemination and cluster ac activities are are key to for for these uh, activities. We participate in several workshops. In one in Brussels, we also try to gather the the industry and policymakers and experts on the legislation legislation and standardization and collaboration with other other projects to address the challenge with the new legislation and standards. Um, I would like to to finish the the presentation with uh, with this slide that is the the impact of the project what we hope to achieve after the end of the project is first to move uh, to a recycling rate between 12% up to 72%. This is in the high impact scenario, including the return to food contact. With SIMPA, we aim to reduce virgin material use, reduce waste incinerated or going to landfills, reduce CO2 emissions, and also retain the economic value uh, to, to achieve a circular economy. And, and, and I think this, this is key for the, for to achieve the, the target set under the European Green Deal, the Circular Economy Action Plan, and also the, the new legislation and standard that are, yeah, that are in progress and that will be available very, very, very soon. So I finish here my presentation. Thank you so much. I think we have now to, to discuss more about, uh, about the, the link between the research activities and the legislation and the standardization work. Thank you, Maria Vera, um, for your presentation. I think in uh, time-wise, we're a little bit behind, so we'll skip on to the panel discussion. Um, in the panel discussion, I would like to uh, ask some questions to our panelists. Um, and uh, let me just start by by directing it to, to you, Hannah. Um, the first question is, um, uh, so did you find any standardization gaps in, uh, in terms of your project up PT? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, in APEX, we are working currently in, on innovative fields as uh, the enzymatic uh, recycling of PET to obtain its monomers 
and in the production of uh, biodegradable and bio-based plastic and that are um, very um, they, they are in very innovative um, uh, fields and methodologies so they address issues that are generally not covered uh, by standardization so we can see them as a gap but also as a, an opportunity to enrich the standardization system by, by incorporating um, new technolo technological developments. So we see a gap, but also an opportunity. I can't hear, sorry. Okay, so uh, let's move on to uh, my next question that is for Cesar. Um, what are the examples of barriers uh, for your technology or innovation? And secondly, how can standards uh, and standards development help address these barriers? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for, for the question. Yes, so barriers are many barriers, actually, because uh, those are new processes. Of course, we are testing them in the lab scale and we are having, of course, some problems. They happen every day. No, we, have, we want to improve and we have some, some things that we have to, 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 to improve every day. No? Also, the next step in which we are now is the industrialization. So once you go from the lab to the, to the big plant, of course, you have to optimize and you have to increase uh, quantities and sometimes you have to, to change you know, a bit the process that you have uh, developed in the lab scale. You know? So it's, a it's, it's research, it's, it's a challenge. And also regarding the question of, uh, I, I, and I will say also important that the feasibility, the economical feasibility, environmental and, and technical, those three vectors should be aligned. You know? So you cannot be only focused on the, part, the technical part, because also the, the economical and the and the, the social and the environmental is important. For for instance, if you have a very good result, but you know that that will be very expensive, that means that it's not going to be implemented in the company. So you have to. So sometimes you have to choose one alternative that maybe has not this perfect result, but is more affordable. No. So this is also a challenge to to see which decision to take to be able that the feasibility. Uh, is aligned with the expectation of the companies. No, this is this is I would say is a challenge, but also is is nice not to, to be working on this and and to and to be able to take those decisions. No, and regarding the how how can uh, like standardization uh, help on this, I have I think it will have many 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 work on this because all the processes we are we are developing all the new materials all the new packaging no, based on recycled material multi-layer. So there are a, a big branch of uh, processes, materials, products, and they have to be standard, standardized. No? For instance, if we implement a new process, we need some guideline in order to know if the implementation of the, the, this, this process in the, in the company, in the factory, is aligned with some specifications. So I would say that as any other product, as any other process, it has to be totally protected by standards because it gives some, um, let's say, uh, rigorous information uh, to the processes and to the consumers. So I think in the following years, many standards will be developed based on uh, identification of plastics, uh, collection of plastics, uh, mechanical recycling, chemical recycling, uh, recycled content. So many, many work to do on the standardization. Thank you for that answer, Cesar. And uh, the next question I would like to ask you, Maria, um, how can uh, the policy framework and regulation leave space for innovation in a circular economy? 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think indeed there is a gap between the knowledge generating in this uh, research and innovation projects and the legislative development, but I have the feeling that the, the this gap is getting smaller and thanks to webinar like this are a perfect platform to bring together the research uh, and innovation community and also the policy and the standardization expert. And I think, uh, yeah, the, as I mentioned in my presentation, the commission is setting very ambitious requirements in terms of recyclability of packaging and, and recycling content. So or for just for the first one, to be uh, to have all packaging recyclable by 2030, we need to find innovative solutions for making uh, pl complex plastic more circular. And here is where, it's, it's where uh, research and innovative projects can play a key role in, in, in achieving these targets. Because right now, we know that this is not the case. And the same with the uh, recycling content plastic. Uh, the new uh, packaging and packaging waste regulation will set uh, recycling content targets even for food contact packaging, uh, not only PET, but we know that this is a huge challenge for flexible packaging, for example. So we need to develop inno innovative solutions to, to be able to reintroduce the recycling materials in food packaging. So uh, here is where I think. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, we can have as you funded projects a big impact on the on the contribution to to the commission's targets thank you maria um i would like to ask the next next question to to you Cesar, again how can research and innovation contribute to standard standardization and what is the impact of uh, this engagement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the ways of uh, connection uh, are, especially we are working in, in the project, we have some, some work on this, on the standardization needs. In many other projects, uh, I have been working on this as well. So uh, is to analyze what is available, what is still missing, and what are the, the needs, the specific needs. No? So this is one of the activities in which uh, projects are, are working. Also, in some other projects, we have even prepared a position paper in which uh, we have defined what are the specific needs. And in fact, we have been in Brussels sometimes uh, in order to invite policy makers, standardization bodies, in order to present those policy papers and to be able to start on to or at least to to uh, to to explain the specific needs we have no once these specific needs are clear then of course for the standardization of bodies uh, so market will, will work let, let's say on this because once the, the need is clear then the standardization bodies will start to do st standards because it will uh, is is let's say is business as well no it's business to to prepare so it's good it's needed but also it's business for the standardization bodies so i think the the good point is just to start this communication to align the needs uh, of the processes with the with the standardization bodies and when this information is clear is is fluent is is totally identified then it's a matter just to start preparing those standards and in, uh, to launch them as soon as possible, no? Because standards makes a, a clarity on the processes that also helps our pro processes to be in the market. Without a standard, without policies, our processes are just research and are not really something uh, able to be in the market. So yeah, co connection is, is very important. Thank you, Cesar, for your answer. And the next question I would like to pose you, uh, Renat, um, how do you think standardization can benefit from research and innovation results? We think the potential impact of the of this kind of project, research and innovation projects in the standardization system can be very high because uh, research and innovation project, projects have a peculiarity and it is that uh, they have the potential to reveal new areas, to discover new fields, to standardize. Uh, so we think it is a, they are a very, very good opportunity for standardization contribution. Um, yeah, some, some ways to contribute are for, um, 
the, the, to, the influence that uh, they can make in the existing standards and uh, the generation of new ones. And on, on the other hand, uh, research and innovation projects also benefit from standardization uh, because uh, it is a very good um, tool, a very an excellent tool to for dissemination and exploitation of the results of the project and for market acceptance. Yeah. Thank you, and um, the last question, Maria. This one is for you again. How uh, will you engage um, in standardization in the future, or how have you engaged in standardization already? Thank you. Um, in as I mentioned in the presentation, in in Simpa we have a dedicated task for legislation and standardization developments, and to analyze what are the needs and challenges. Simpa prepared this report analyzing the impacts of the European directives, but also national plans uh, in the circularity of multilayer plastic films. We analyze European directives and regulations, but also national rules in France, uh, the Netherlands, Spain, and, and Finland. And one of the main conclusions of this report, and, and it was like uh, mentioning before in the in some of the presentations, is that there is a clear near for a Harmonization for harmonization. We need clear rules, and here's where standardization standardization can can contribute. Uh, if if what if I can highlight one example is that is key for multi-layer plastic films is the definition of recyclability. And this was mentioned uh, for I don't know Ben San before that every every country has a different definition of recyclability. So. Uh, when we know when we knew, knew in Simpa that um, the, the a new um, working group ten uh, was going to be established on design for recycling for plastic packaging, we decided that we need to get to be more involved in this standardization committee. We need to be able to be there to transfer what we are doing in Simpa for new designs for more recyclable, recyclable packaging to translate this in, this knowledge into the to the ongoing work on the standardization. And that's why also with the support of Orison Booster, we we now are trying to, to find an expert of, from Simpa Consortium to be in the meetings where, where this work is going to be developed on defining uh, design for recycling guidelines. So we hope uh, we can contribute as, as Simpa with quality input, input to, to the success of this standardization work. Thank you very much, Maria. So that was the, the last of the questions I uh, got to ask you here. And next up, I would like to uh, to uh, um, welcome the participants in the panel discussion. If you have any question to our questions to our panelists, so I think we have at this point forty uh, participants. So please, the floor is yours. If you have any questions. No, I think. Then um, I'd like to say thank you to all of our panelists for their uh, for the answers to all the questions. It was uh, great to have some insight into the projects and how you will pursue in the future, but also uh, as to what you've already done standardization wise and. The, in the usage of standards in your projects already. Um, and also thank you for the ideas as to how to proceed in uh, with standardization within the field of uh, plastic recyclability in the future. Um, next up, I would like to do a short presentation on uh, HS Booster and why we uh, have HS Booster and what the aims of HS Booster are. Um, let me just see. Yes. I will just share my screen. So I hope it's uh, visible. Yeah, perfect. So let me just see. Yeah. 
So the Horizon Standardization Booster, that is what HS Booster stands for, it was uh, launched by the European Commission and is uh, meant to last up until March 2024 as a two-year project. In the consortium, apart from me and my colleagues in Denmark, we also uh, gather uh, participants from Italy, Serbia, Ireland and Spain uh, with all our areas of uh, specialties. And it's important to say that uh, the booster services that we give to uh, projects that apply for consultancy are free of charge. And what we do is give free support on standardization and knowledge on the usage of standards. Um, we have var various support tools, primarily on the hsbooster.eu webpage. And we also uh, have a training academy, which Nicholas already presented um, uh, in terms of uh, an upcoming webinar. So this is linked to uh, our training academy, which is available on the uh, HS Booster webpage. So the target groups of Horizon Standardization Booster are uh, research and innovation projects that have uh, achieved funding from the EU. So primarily Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe projects. Um, and also standardization experts. The purpose of uh, HS Booster is to give uh, European research and innovation projects the opportunity to both increase their impact on uh, the European market and gain market access. And also, uh, of course, to support the European green and digital agenda by using standards and contributing to the future standardization um, and uh, keep this influx of uh, uh, information uh, and knowledge into European standardization in the future. So what happens, oh sorry, what are the benefits for the projects uh, who participate in HS Booster? First of all, this is an opportunity to meet standardization experts around Europe, but also globally. Um, the project get to learn more about standards and standardization landscape. Um, they get to, uh, the chance to develop a standardization strategy and also to receive relevant training. So these are just some of the main benefits. And uh, on this note, I'd like to uh, also just uh, raise awareness about the Training Academy, 4th of May, on from 10 to 12. And uh, here, this, this webinar is primarily for those interested in getting more information about uh, the basics of standardization, whether you are a researcher, perhaps just uh, lacking some knowledge that would like to fill the gaps on uh, standardization and standards. And the flagship of HS Booster are these uh, uh, open calls within various uh, fields, and we cover almost anything within the uh, newer modern technology. So uh, apply if you have any ideas at all. Um, so first of all, what happens is that uh, the research and innovation project apply to an open call that fits the topic of research. Then, the project is matched with a standardization expert uh, within that exact field of, a, of a work for the project. And then the consultancy services are tailored according to the project's needs. And there can be uh, from two to four uh, online consultancy services for the projects. This depends on the, on the project's needs. And as I, as I already said, it's a, uh, free of charge for European research and innovation projects. That being said, projects that have uh, achieved funding from Europe. And on this note, I should say that the projects, uh, sorry, the experts that we uh, cover in this uh, HS Booster are paid 500 euros per completed counseling. So this could be uh, over two uh, full working days, uh, two to four uh, online consultation um, services. 
And lastly, I would just uh, remind you that in order to register for HS Booster, you're welcome to visit the hsbooster.eu uh, webpage where you go to the project and register page. So this is actually the exact link. If you type this in your computer, you'll get to the registration page and it's, everything is online. You don't have to open new windows. Um, and also to register for the training academy, the 4th of May, you need to go to the hsbooster.eu webpage and then uh, push on the news and events uh, to, to see the event uh, itself. I'm not going to post a link here because that's a bit too long. Yeah, so uh, that was all from me for the HS proof the presentation. And then next up, I would like to uh, ask a question also to the participants. Um, and you can, uh, th this is done through Slido, if you can enter that. Uh, uh, where you're sitting from, you can answer the question. Um, yeah, let's see. I think Julie is uh, sending a reminder in the chat. Yeah. And this question is, what do you want to learn more or explore in any upcoming webinar? So these are for the 33 participants that are still with us. Do you have any ideas or any suggestions? things that you would like covered in the future. Let's see. So at a later stage, we're also having another webinar. So you're, of course, also welcome to think about this outside uh, this webinar. Oh, there's a there's one here, a best practice. Yeah. OK, so best practice. Uh, this could be in, in relation to standardization processes or. Yeah, I think that's the open question. Yeah. So we are welcome to join the upcoming webinars as well and uh, to think about this question. Uh, if you haven't got any uh, anything to add here. So I'll just uh, remind you once again that this uh, webinar here is being is, has been recorded. And if there's something that you missed, then you're always welcome to go back and listen to the recording. And after we've ended our webinar here, you'll get a follow-up uh, email with all the practical information and where to go further if you need more information. Oh, there's some, uh, okay, some suggestions as to practical examples. Info on standardization requests, yeah. Mm -hmm. Development process, yeah. Yeah, industry role and research and innovation. So I think we're going to end it here. Um, if you have any other suggestions, you're very welcome to keep in touch with us after the webinar. And also, if you have any direct questions to the three projects that presented their cases here today, you're very welcome to contact them directly. I'm sure they'll be of a great help to you in answering your questions. And this goes also in terms of uh, practical uh, examples, further practical examples in these uh, projects. So on this note, I just want to say thank you to all of our participants and all of our pa panelists for a great uh, 
discussions and great presentations. And I hope to see you all again in the next webinar. So I will just, uh, I will leave here and say thank you.